to talk about the trace determinant plane. Before we do so, let's review some ideas from before about solving second order linear differential equations. Let's consider a two dimensional linear system with constant coefficients. We can express this as dy dt equals a times y for some two by two matrix A having constant coefficients. We've seen that if x and y are solutions to this system, then they are both solutions to a second order linear equation d squared y dt squared plus a constant p times dy dt plus another constant q times y equals zero. Conversely, given a second order linear equation with constant coefficients, we can express this as a two dimensional linear system with constant coefficients. Indeed, we can make the substitution capital Y equals Y comma V and capital A, our matrix, is zero, one, negative Q, negative P. We're motivated by the question, can we use what we know about two dimensional systems to solve second order equations? Remind you the algorithm of how we solve a two dimensional system. That is how we find a general solution, let's say in the form capital Y equals a constant k sub 1 times y sub 1 plus another constant k sub 2 times y sub 2. First step, compute eigenvalues as roots of the characteristic polynomial lambda squared plus p lambda plus q. Second, compute eigenvectors v1 and v2 as well as generalized eigenvectors w sub 1 if necessary. And finally, compute real valued functions capital Y sub 1 and capital Y sub 2 according to the table you see listed on your screen. Using this, we can write down an algorithm to finding the general solution to a second order differential equation. First step, compute the roots lambda of the characteristic polynomial lambda squared plus p lambda plus q. And second, compute the real valued functions y sub 1 of t and y sub 2 of t as in the table listed below. You'll notice that even though we can express this second order equation as a two-dimensional system, we really don't need to compute eigenvalues and generalized eigenvectors in order to solve this system. Today, we're going to talk about the trace determinant plane. Let's review by first going over some properties of two-dimensional systems. We've just seen that if we have a two-dimensional system, that is, a system of differential equations in the form dy dt equals a times y, where a is a two by two matrix having constant coefficients, we can find the general solution capital Y of t as follows. First, we'll compute eigenvalues lambda as roots of the characteristic polynomial, which we can express in the form lambda squared minus t times lambda plus d. Second, we'll compute eigenvectors v as solutions to the system a minus lambda i2 times v equals the zero vector, and possibly generalized eigenvectors w as solutions to a times lambda i sub 2 times w equals r eigenvector v. Third, we'll compute real valued functions capital Y sub 1 and capital Y sub 2 according to the table below. We've also seen that the coordinates, namely x and y, are solutions to this second order linear equation having constant coefficients. That is d squared y dt squared plus t times dy dt plus d times y equals zero. Here we've denoted capital T as lowercase a plus d as the trace of our matrix A, while we've denoted capital D as lowercase a times lowercase d minus lowercase b times lowercase c as the determinant of our two by two matrix A. We also have a similar proposition by looking at the second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients. Let's say that we have a system of the form d squared y dt squared plus a constant p times dy dt plus q times y equals zero. We can find the general solution by the following two steps. First, we'll compute lambda, roots lambda of the characteristic polynomial lambda squared minus capital T times lambda plus capital D. And second, computing real value functions y sub 1 and y sub 2 according to the table that you see here on your screen. Second, as the converse to the theorem that we had above, we see that we can express this second order linear equation as a two dimensional linear system having constant coefficients. 
you'll observe here that capital T is negative P, just the trace of our two by two matrix A, whereas capital D is lowercase q, is the determinant of this two by two matrix A. Now let's put all of this together to think of the following motivating question. The general solution, it doesn't matter if you write this as lowercase y in terms of k1 times y1 plus k1 times y2, or uppercase y as k1 times uppercase y sub 1 plus k sub 2 times uppercase y sub 2, seems to really depend upon the roots lambda of the characteristic polynomial. These roots we can write in terms of capital T, as well as the square root of capital T squared minus 4 times capital D. We'd like to know, can we determine the behavior of these solutions, capital Y of T and lowercase y of T, just from these parameters, capital T and capital D alone? Today, we have one main theorem that explains, yes, we can actually answer this motivating question in the affirmative. Let's consider a two-dimensional system, d capital Y dt equals capital A times capital Y, and we'll denote capital T as the trace of our matrix A, and capital D as the determinant of our matrix A. First of three statements says, the eigenvalues of this matrix A are real and distinct if and only if capital D is less than capital T squared over four. If the determinant D is negative, then there's a unique equilibrium point and it is a saddle. If the determinant capital D is positive, then our unique equilibrium point is either a sink or a source, depending on whether the trace capital T is negative or the trace capital T is positive. If the determinant D equals zero, then there is a line of sinks or a line of sources when T is negative or T is positive, respectively. Next statement, the eigenvalues are repeated if and only if capital D equals capital T squared over four. If capital T is equal to zero, then there are infinitely many equilibrium points Y sub zero. Otherwise, that is if T does not equal to zero, then there is just one equilibrium point, namely the origin, and this is either a sink or a source, depending upon whether T is negative or T is positive. And for the final statement, the eigenvalues are complex numbers if and only if d is greater than t squared over 4. Moreover, in this case, there's just one equilibrium point, namely the origin, and this is a spiral sink, a center, or a spiral source, depending upon whether t is negative, zero, or positive, respectively. Now, there's a lot of information here in this theorem, so let's try to give a graphical interpretation of what's going on here. Here, we had information in terms of the trace t and the determinant d. So we will consider a plane consisting of points t, comma, d, where we can divide this plane into several regions. First, we can consider the place where d is less than zero. That is, this is below the t-axis. In this case, we have real eigenvalues which are distinct, and all of our direction fields will contain saddles. Second, we can consider the region just above the t-axis but below the parabola. That is, d is between 0 and t squared over 4. In this case, we have real eigenvalues that are distinct. We have sinks if t is negative and sources if t is positive. Next, we can consider the region that is above the parabola. That is, d is greater than t squared over 4. In this case, we have complex eigenvalues, so we have either spiral sinks if t is negative, centers if t is zero, or spiral sources if t is positive. And finally, we can consider the two curves that are here on this page. You can either say we're on the parabola, that is d equals t squared over four, or we're on the t-axis, that is d is equal to zero. In these cases, we have repeated eigenvalues and or zero eigenvalues. And in fact, we have sinks if t is negative and sources if t is positive. Now, we'd like to spend the remainder of the time giving a sketch of how to prove this main result. Let's begin with an observation. Observe that if lambda 1 and lambda 2 are roots of the characteristic polynomial, then our lambda squared plus, minus t lambda plus d factors as lambda minus lambda 1 times lambda minus lambda 2. 
which means that the trace t is the sum of the eigenvalues and the determinant d is the product of the eigenvalues. In fact, we can also see that the discriminant, namely t squared minus 4d, is simply the square of the difference lambda 1 minus lambda 2. We have three cases to consider depending upon whether we have real distinct eigenvalues, real repeated eigenvalues, or complex eigenvalues. First, let's assume that our eigenvalues are real and distinct. This means that our discriminant, t squared minus 4d, is positive. So we can find solutions now by looking at straight line solutions. If d is negative, then this means one of our eigenvalues must be negative and the other eigenvalue must be positive. Notice that if the eigenvalue lambda 1 is negative, then e to the lambda 1t tends to 0 as t increases without bound. On the other hand, because our eigenvalue lambda 2 is positive, e to the lambda 2t increases without bound. That is, it goes to infinity as t increases without bound. This means that our equilibrium point y sub 0, which is the origin, must be a saddle. On the other hand, let's say that d is positive, but still less than t squared over 4. Then this means that our eigenvalues must have the same sign. Either both lambda 1 and lambda 2 are positive, or both lambda 1 and lambda 2 are negative. This means that our equilibrium point y sub 0 must either be a sink or a source, depending upon whether both eigenvalues are negative or both eigenvalues are positive. And finally, let's consider the case where d is equal to 0. In this case, at least one of the eigenvalues must be 0, let's say lambda 1, and we also see that actually one of the eigen the other eigenvalue must be non-zero. That is, either lambda sub 2 is less than 0 or lambda sub 2 is greater than 0. All of the equilibrium points y sub 0 must be multiples of some eigenvector v sub 1 corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda sub 1. The other straight line solution must, must correspond to the other eigenvalue lambda sub 2, and we can actually see how this either increases or decreases as t increases without bound, depending upon the sign of lambda sub 2. That is, if lambda sub 2 is negative, then this y sub 2 of t just tends to y sub 0, whereas if lambda sub 2 is positive, then this y sub 2 of t will just increase without bound. Let's now consider the second case when our eigenvalues are repeated. In this case, t squared minus 4d, our discriminant, is equal to 0, so we can solve for d to find that d equals t squared over 4. If t does not equal to 0, then d does not equal to 0. Again, d equals t squared over 4. So there must be a unique equilibrium point y sub 0. We can find the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues, generalize eigenvectors if necessary, to see that our two solutions will be y sub 1 equals e to the lambda 1t times our eigenvector v sub 1. And y sub 2 will be one of two cases, depending on either whether A is a scalar matrix or not. Now, let's take a look at these solutions by realizing that both of them involve the exponential e to the lambda 1t. If the trace, capital T, is negative, then our eigenvalue, lambda sub 1, must also be negative, and hence e to the lambda 1t must tend to 0 as t increases without bound. This means that our equilibrium point, y sub 0, must be a sink. On the other hand, if capital T, our trace, is positive, then our eigenvalue lambda sub 1 must also be positive, and so the exponential e to the lambda 1t must tend to infinity as t increases without bound. This means that our equilibrium point y sub 0 must be a source. For our last case, let's say that we have complex eigenvalues. Then we can express our eigenvalues of the form alpha plus or minus i times beta, which means that the trace t, which is the sum of the eigenvalues, must be twice alpha, and the discriminant d, which is the product of the eigenvalues, must be alpha squared plus beta squared. We can easily compute that t squared minus 4d, the discriminant, must be negative 4 beta squared, hence the discriminant must be a negative quantity. Now, one eigenvector we can choose corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda 1 is the v sub 1 you see up on your screen. And therefore, by running through the algorithm we've introduced here in this class, we can find an explicit formula for our functions y sub 1 of t and y sub 2 of t. The important statement here is that both of these involve an exponential e to the alpha t. 
If our trace, capital T, is negative, then alpha is negative, and so the exponential e to the alpha t must tend to zero as t increases without bound. This means that our unique equilibrium point, y sub zero, must be a spiral sink. If our trace, capital T, equals zero, then alpha equals zero, and so by definition, our equilibrium point, y sub zero, is called a center. Finally, if our trace, capital T, is positive, then alpha is positive, and so e to the alpha t increases without bound, as t also increases without bound. Hence, our equilibrium point, y sub zero, must be a spiral source. Here, we'll put everything together in one place so that you can see how all of this fits together. On the right hand two columns, you can see the trace and the determinant. Notice that these values do allow us to break up the trace determinant plane into various regions. In the middle, you see properties of the eigenvalues. Notice that essentially these are the three cases that were in the proof. Either we have real distinct eigenvalues, real repeated eigenvalues, or complex eigenvalues. In the last two columns, you can see now the equilibrium points and how those relate to the straight line solutions. Recall that if you have real distinct eigenvalues, that essentially you will have two eigenvectors, and you can use these two eigenvectors to compute straight line solutions. If we have real repeated eigenvalues, then we have to be a little bit careful about the straight line solutions. We may have straight line solutions if we know that we have a basis of eigenvectors. Otherwise, we'll have to compute an eigenvector as well as a generalized eigenvector. And finally, for the complex numbers, we know that our solutions will all look like spirals. Either they'll be spirals that will spiral into the center, spiral away from the center, or simply circle around the center. Thanks very much for watching.